Hello there, sports fans, and welcome to another episode of Circling the Bases, proudly a part of NBC Sports Edge. I am your host, Colin Henderson. Joining me today on a special mid-season episode is the full CTB crew, DJ Short, Drew Silva, and Mr. Christopher Crawford. Boys, welcome, and congrats on a first half done. Thanks for having us. <laughs> I'm glad the All-Star Weekend finished up as we've just gotten through that. Much nicer AL and NL All-Star uniforms than whatever the heck those future <laughs> uniforms were. <laughs> so we are recording this, obviously, coming up on the show today. We will discuss the first half, discuss some of the biggest surprises and disappointments so far, and begin to preview what we should expect to see over the remainder of the season. And be sure to start the second half of the season the right way this Sunday, as weekends are better with MLB Sunday leadoff coverage presented by Uber Eats. Catch the Cubs take on the Phillies on Sunday, July 24th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, live on NBC and Peacock. To learn more, go to PeacockTV.com slash MLB. And if you want a chance to win twenty five grand on the game, be sure to download the NBC Sports Predictor app powered by PointsBet and enter Sunday's free Grand Slam Pick'em contest. And while you're at it, be sure to stick around after the game this Sunday, as Chris and I will be live on YouTube after the post game to preview the upcoming week and answer all of your burning fantasy questions. So let's get right to the first half here. And obviously, uh, what we're about a little, what, 57%, I think, of the way through the season. So not an ideal first half, second half, but tons of takeaways from the first half. And obviously, we're going to open it up to the panel here. But let's start off with the first one, which was the Yankees obviously dominating an historical first half there. Um have slipped up a little bit of late, currently playing the Astros in a doubleheader today, which I'm very curious about just in terms of the larger uh, meaning of those games as the two biggest rivals in the American League. But Yankees having a historical first half. Um, Aaron Judge on a mantle, I mean, on a Maris Ruth-esque run towards 60 home runs. So let's start with that to lead off the first half. Obviously, the Yankees being where they are now, how much... Is, is there anyone out there who can catch them over the second half of the season? I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think they've, they've built up a, you know, a, a pretty good lead here. It's going to be really, even if they play, you know, just pretty good during the right. second half, I still mm-hmm. think there, there's nobody that, that can catch them. Um, you know, I think a big key for the Yankees is just like judge and Stanton staying healthy. I yeah, mean, right. that makes that lineup that much more dangerous. I didn't, I didn't think the Yankees would be, I mean, obviously I didn't think they'd be this good, but I, I think this, the, the biggest surprise for me has been the pitching staff, mm-hmm. just one through five, yeah. so consistent. Obviously Nestor Cortez has been, you know, a sensation, but it, it certainly goes well beyond that. You know, Jordan Montgomery is someone we've said has been underappreciated, you know, Garrett Cole straightened things out. I mean, I just consistent, you know, day in, day out, good pitching, great lineup, not surprising to see where they are. The defense has been really great too. Yeah, I mean, I I put I I put a lot of faith in the Blue Jays going into the year. Yeah, same. Um, and I, you know, perhaps put some action on them to win the AL East. <laughs> and what are they right now? Like thirteen plus games back in the division. They are so fourteen and a half. Fourteen and a half. And I I think they have a run in them in the second half. Like mm-hmm. it's still a really well rounded roster mm-hmm. uh, between the pitching and the lineup and and even the bullpen. And I think they're going to do some interesting things at the deadline. Um, I was caught off guard by them firing Charlie Montoyo in, in the first, I mean, that, that the final week of the first half that, yeah. that caught me off guard, but it kind of encapsulates how disappointing they were over the first three months of the season. And maybe they're getting a little interim manager boost under John Schneider. I think they won five of their last six games to close out you know, heading into the all-star break. Granted, a lot of those were against the Phillies and Royals who didn't have their full right. uh, roster because of vaccination status. I'll be interested to see if the Canadian government makes a change to that leading into the playoffs. I think it's going to affect the trade deadline. Um, it's going to affect what, what the Blue Jays can add and what you know other teams in the AL feel like they want to add. They're probably going to shy away from a lot of unvaxxed players or, or try to convince them to get vaccinated. And I, I don't want to make this whole show about that, but I, I, I think the blue Jays have a run in them in the second half. I think they're going to make the playoffs and then they're not a, a kind of team that you're going to want to face in like the wild card round. 
it's kind of interesting looking at the Yankees too, that like they've been so good, but they haven't really been like fantasy dominant. Like I was just looking at the New York Yankees page. Aaron judge obviously is the highest ranked player in Yahoo because he's hit a billion home runs and he's driven in 70 runs. But like, after that, it's Garrett Cole's ranked 23rd, Anthony Rizzo's ranked 37th, DJ LeMay, who's ranked 52nd. You'd think a team with this many wins would have like a bunch of top 10, top 15 fantasy performers, but they're just so well-rounded. There's so much depth on this team. I, I do think that they are going to slow down just because that AL East is so good, and I don't think we can underrate how much more competitive Baltimore is. Like the fact that, no, they're not going to be have like the win streak that they had, but that's a solid baseball team right now with some fun young players to watch. Uh, I don't think anybody can catch them just because they have two weeks worth of games that ahead of everybody. So unless they just absolutely crater, but I do think this will be a much more competitive division down the stretch, but I don't think anyone's catching the Yankees. I mean, pretty impressive when you think about the Yankees, just obviously in general of their record being what it is, but also being in a division where three, yep. it's very possible they're putting four teams in the postseason this year. I mean, obviously, Mariners win streak notwithstanding, but prior to that, it was basically four American League East teams and the Royals, who are still a 500 ball club right now as we speak. So mm -hmm. just really impressive knowing that the Yankees have obviously put up this record that they have, and they've had to go against playoff caliber teams and the Orioles for a good portion of it. Um, one one thing if we're talking like futures here, like let's put it out on the table. So the Mariners mm -hmm. in 2001, didn't they win 117 games? 116 games. 116 and 46. Yep. Okay. So do the Yankees top that at 117? Do you think no. they get there? No, there's just too That's much. Great. There's just too much depth in the American League East and they'll have, you know, there's going to be some injury bugs. There's going to be some things that happen. I mean, that Mariner team, it took a just unbelievable – winning 18 games every single month of the season. That is asking so much for a, a Major League Baseball team to do. Um, yeah, I think that record might be one that sticks for a little while. Yankees, to break that record, would have to go 52-18 and 18 over the remainder Ooh. of the season. <laughs> That's tough. It's, it's certainly tough. And I think one of the things that goes against it is the fact that right now they have a 13 game lead in the division. So yeah. how much are they really pushing themselves in September? Because they point. don't care about 117 wins in the regular season. They care about 27 at the end of the year. So that, I mean, I just don't see them being pushed unless the Astros continue to nip at their heels. And we've seen from 2017, 2018, 2019, whoever has home field from that, you know, from that matchup in a theoretical postseason um, head to head, it matters. So maybe the Astros push the Yankees a little bit towards the end of the season, but mm -hmm. right now that it's not going to be pushed from the division, I could see them really trying to just maintain for the month of September. And they don't particularly care what the W's and L's are. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. Uh, let's talk about also, I, I had to remind myself uh, as we're talking about the first, uh, the first half, it feels a distant memory that we had a lockout like six months ago. And yeah. it's pretty amazing that we went from just an absolute cold period from November 1st, 2021 to March like 8th of 2022. And it feels like that lockout is as close as the 95 lockout was. Like it just feels so long ago. The page has been turned. Uh, how have you guys felt this season obviously has progressed knowing that it started on such shaky ground? Yeah, that's how it always goes with this stuff. Like, remember when they were trying to get the 2020 season started? It was very mm -hmm. contentious. Yep. Um, and then, like, the next day after they finally got a deal done, people just forgot about it. And I, I, I think that's just the way negotiations go in baseball. It gets really tense because each side wants to, to get the best deal in place. Um, and once that deal is worked out, I think maybe the sides still have some tension, but the fans don't really care. They just want to watch their favorite team and make up their fantasy lineup. So I, I think it's pretty natural that we've, we've just moved past that. Um, it's been an interesting season. I like, I don't, I don't know. I don't have like a lot, a lot of hot takes on how the season has gone in general. Certainly dominant starting pitching was like the, the big storyline early, early on. And still you look at, you know, the overall team leaderboards, like I think almost 20 teams have a combined ERA under four. You don't see that often. There are 
22 pitchers with an ERA under three. Like the, the Cy Young races are going to be really interesting in that regard. Like we're going to be talking about, do you value run prevention as much as strikeouts? Again, you know, that old debate, especially when it comes to Sandy Alcantara, who's really running away with it uh, in terms of like the betting markets. Um, so now I'm, I'm not surprised that we, we kind of moved on from the lockout. It, uh, it, it for a while it seemed like the season wasn't going to start until June, so I'm just, yeah. I'm just glad we got it underway at least. Yeah, I think in general, like even just speaking as a culture right now, we have sort of this short-term attention span, yeah. so things yes. that are in the headlines tend to fade, tend to fade like pretty quickly. So I'm, I'm not surprised that it really, you know, has been much of a topic of conversation. No, we're a fickle, fickle species, <laughs> and what it's all about. Uh, what have you done for me lately and what is happening in front of my face lately? So, yeah, it, but I mean, those times stunk. It was not fun dealing with that stuff. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that we don't ever have to deal with something like that again, but I know we will and uh, we will forget all about it in 2026 as well. <laughs> as we we've spoken about the Yankees, we've spoken about uh, some of that. Let's also start looking at kind of the futures when we talk about teams in, in particular, obviously the, AL West, pretty much a foregone conclusion, despite the run that the Mariners have been on. I don't think anyone's catching the Astros. Obviously, the East, no one's catching the Yankees. Out West, it's going to be incredibly difficult for anyone to catch the Dodgers. But the other three divisions, very much up for grabs. Obviously, Mm -hmm. the National League East and both um, leagues' central divisions. Uh, Let's talk about the National League East a little bit first. Obviously, the Mets are currently leading that division by two and a half games over right. the Braves. Uh, Braves have been storming of late, though, seven and three in their last 10. Um, obviously, when we talk about this division, it's very tough to cap this division when we're looking at the two main starters in New York and saying that's really where this is going to go. How healthy and how effective can Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer be over the course of the season? That's really going to impact who ends up winning that division. Yeah, totally. I mean, and, you know, we heard this week that DeGrom's uh, rehab start, which might have been his final rehab start, got pushed back, or I think it was a sim game. Sim game, yeah. uh, With a little bit of shoulder soreness. They're saying it's not a big deal, but anytime you hear anything physical with DeGrom these days, of course, you get a little concerned. Sure. Um, So that's going to be important. But I also think, it's weird to say this, but I I feel like that angle of it might be somewhat overrated because Mm -hmm. it's very clear that the Mets need a bat. Yes. And I yeah. think if they can get that bat to serve as a, you know, regular DH, you know, lots of Mets fans are hoping if, you know, Francisco Alvarez comes up, maybe that'll still happen. But they need another bat in this lineup. The pitching is held up surprisingly well. And I think they could still be pretty respectable, um, even if hopefully DeGrom will be back. You know, I am a Mets fan, so I'm biased. But uh, let's say he doesn't. I still think they're going to have a pretty good pitching staff. Um, mm-hmm. They probably need some bullpen help. But that I think getting the bat is sort of the overlooked angle of the Mets right now. They need to do that. This is going to be a fun one, I think, just because, I mean, I, I love this Atlanta lineup too. And I love the fact that uh, Charlie Morton has been for the most part, much better after a lot of people were starting to write him off after the first month of the season. This is going to be really interesting. And I also think Atlanta has put themselves in position to, you know, we saw them be aggressive without giving up a ton of prospects to make the big moves that they did. It's amazing what happens when teams try, by the way. You can actually win a World Series. How about that? I'm going to be really curious to see what these two t- clubs do. And the Phillies, I'm not writing the Phillies out either, man. That is a yeah. talented roster. And if they can get Bryce Harper back at some point in August, that's huge. I mean, you there's he's literally the reigning MVP, and he was having an MVP-esque season. This is going to be a fun one. I'm really excited to see what happens. And the Marlins are fun to watch, too. And the Washington Nationals are also a baseball team. Are they, though? Uh, By definition. Like, they have to file as one. So they technically are. (laughs) Yeah. They want to sell sell the franchise. So I guess they're technically one of 30 teams in Major League Baseball. That is correct. Yep. They have a franchise to sell in the first place. That's their actual slogan on the television right now is right before they start. Instead of like CS Rise or You Gotta Believe, it says one of 30 teams in Major League Baseball. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, Uh, I think think the Mets are going to be, you know, they'll have the potential at least to be a better second half team than a first half team. And they just had the best first half since 1986, which was the Mm. last team to win a World Series title there. 
Um, with yeah, if they can get Scherzer and Degrom going in the rotation at the same time, look out. Uh, I agree. The Braves are really fun, and the Phillies have some of the best top end talent in the majors too. I worry about their depth, and they're probably right. going to have to get creative at the deadline. Um, what What are your feelings, DJ, on the Degrom situation? I you kind of glossed over it a little bit <laughs> because so, I have no expectations. Like yeah. I, I feel like uh, yeah. that's where Mets fans are right now. Like it's easy to just say, like well, you know, when he's back, he's going to be great. You know, and, but I just. I, it's hard for me to like see it. Like I, I have to actually see him on the mound pitching to believe it. Sure. Kind of where I am right now. Um, so to me, I think I think anything you get from him is a bonus. That's how I feel. You, you just can't count on it um, moving forward. So it sounds like they're just being, you know, abundance and caution, like that kind of terminology. So I guess we have to take them at their word, but. You know, I'm, I'm I mean, not making yeah. any contact. So, either. yeah, th- they moved back his sim game from Tuesday to Thursday because he had some shoulder soreness on Sunday. I would think that that is just routine soreness, right? I mean, I wake up and my shoulder hurts sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I'm i optimistic. He's supposed to throw uh, the sim game again on, on Thursday. It hasn't happened yet, according to the Mets beat writers, but they're all kind of waiting for word on that. Um, and if that goes well, he probably does a fourth minor league rehab start next week, and then maybe they can. I mean, he's been dominant yeah, in the minors so far. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Starts, so, so there's, he's there's very much like himself. So. Right. It's so, just yeah. you can't take any risks with Jacob Degrom. I mean, you can't. The he's such an important part of that team, and having him for the postseason, and you know, barring a massive collapse, the New York Mets are going to be one of the six postseason teams. Hold my beer. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, that's I, I have seen weirder You're things happen. You're speaking to a Mets fan right yeah, now. Yeah, right? I, I have, I have, I have seen weirder things happen, but it's it's very hard for me in looking uh, at the current national they're, league structure. They're good. They're good. Yeah, yeah. they are good. Yeah, it's but I mean, it's just you have to be so careful with Degrom. And hopefully, everything goes well and. But shoulders, man, if, if there was a way to ban shoulders in 2022, mm-hmm. I would do it just because this is that it's very, very difficult to come back from. I am cautiously optimistic we get to see him at uh, the MLB level, at the level that we saw Jacob DeGrom before. But uh, I'm like DJ, I need to see it actually happen. How much does the fact that obviously DeGrom is in a not official, but will be a walk year in this conversation with an opt out at the end. How much does that change this conversation about? Obviously, you know, you want to make sure you take your sweet time and keep, and treat him with child gloves to get him back and be a hundred percent healthy. But at the same time, like the farther and farther we go into this process, the more and more this affects the Mets this year. And there's a chance that he's not wearing Mets colors next year. How much, I mean, like how much does that change the conversation for, I mean, I'll ask you DJ as a Met fan. Yeah, I think it's, man, it's so many angles at play. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. at a certain point, does he say to himself, like, is it worth opting out? Or maybe he still would opt out and then take the biggest one-year contract he could get Mm -hmm. to kind of prove it. Um, Sure. so, So, and from the Mets perspective, you know, this might be it. So they might toward the end say, Hey, come back as a reliever. Like we'll take whatever we can get. I mean, there's so many possible, um, you know, ways this could play out. Um, not necessarily all with the contract in mind, but at a certain point, you know, that's something that Grom's going to have to think about, um, if it's worth risking, um, and, and going out there, I think he would want to, you know, for peace of mind going in the off season, you know, show what he can do. I think that's what he wants. He wants to win. He's looking at the Mets being a team who could, who could win a world series this mm-hmm. year. I mean, that's going right. to be a motivator. Uh, I think the money is, will be there, you know, but I think he wants to win. He's been waiting for that with the Mets. So, uh, you know, I think that's what his drive is right now. The Phillies eight and a half games back from the Mets right now, the Braves two and a half Mets are minus minus one ninety one on points bets to win the East right now. Braves plus one fifty. Phillies mm. 25 to one odds to win the National League East. If you're looking for value, and looking for a second half resurgence, that's not a it's not a bad one to throw a couple bucks on. But um, eight and a half games is a, a pretty steep is a pretty steep climb to get yeah. over two very good teams, including one that just won a World Series last year. Yeah, let's talk about 
Um, I don't want to be rude when I say this, but the flyover divisions in the central. Wow. Uh, that is rude, actually. That is yeah, very a little rude. rude. Um, <laughs> no. We are just currently in a spot right now. The American League Central and the National League Central, both not sporting um, particularly strong teams right now. Minnesota currently leads the American League Central, um, a two-game lead over Cleveland and a three-game lead over the White Sox. Meanwhile, in the National League Central, the Brewers have a half-game lead over the Cardinals, just one game ahead. Uh, Cardinals just one game back in the loss column. Um, so a, a two-horse race there in the National League Central. Let's talk about both of those a little bit. And let's start with the American League. Obviously, a lot of hype going into the season about the Chicago White Sox. Um, and they have really probably been the most disappointing team in the majors, a 500 record right now, 46 and 46 coming out of the break, including six games under 500 at home, which is shocking. Um, they obviously have been dealing with a ton of injuries this year. Lance Lynn, uh, Yohan Mankata, Eloy Jimenez. I mean, the list goes on and on with them, but they're getting healthier now. So how much faith do you feel in the White Sox potentially trying to erase this disappointing first half with a strong second? I think you got to keep in mind that the White Sox, you know, they have that excellent manager that's really going to help them over the second <laughs> half of the season. Um, I'm pretty confident only because I think this division sucks out loud that they can get back into this thing. Um, one thing that's going to hurt Minnesota, Chicago is that their farm system is dreadful. So they're not going to be able to be able to make a, the move. The, the Guardians, if they actually want to spend some money, have a great farm system to make some acquisitions. The Twins have plenty of guys available to make the to make a necessary transaction. I hate the cliche of like getting a guy healthy is a uh, a trade deadline acquisition, but like getting some of these guys healthy and just pitching better, like more consistency out of Luke Giolito and stuff like that is going to give them a great chance on paper. I think they are the best roster. It's far from a cakewalk though. I really think Minnesota and Cleveland do have some chances to win this thing. And in part, just because of how close they are right now. And because the talent disparity is not what I thought it was coming into the year. Yeah. I, I agree with Chris that it's, it's the, the White Sox have the best talent on paper in this division it's weird that it hasn't really happened for them yet similar to the blue jays i expect them to go on some kind of run in the second half lucas giolito showed a lot better to close out the first half i think that's even more crucial to this club than really anything than like dylan cease continuing to dominate they need right. giolito to be close to lucas giolito and there was one bad start in july but overall his last five starts he's been a lot more effective and Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that'll that go a long way. And then getting healthier and I don't know, the, the Tony La Russa stuff I feel like is just almost like a distraction where it doesn't really affect their – maybe he's made some bad decisions here and there. Maybe. But yeah. Okay. You think so? You think but he I, maybe made some bad decisions? I don't think he's like a, a detriment to the level of like multiple wins, you know. No, I, that's I, fair. I, I, it, it's hard to measure. Yeah. Um Real quick, though, the, the thing about, like, Giolito being better is, Johnny Cueto, I love you. you. There's no way in hell you are pitching at the level that you have pitched at so far this year. So I think there's going to be a little bit of trade-off here. And what was once a team that had as much starting pitching depth as anybody has, like, none now. So that's going to be really interesting to follow as well. Yeah, I mean, the White Sox didn't make a qualifying offer to Carlos Rodon, which is still yep. amazing baffling. to me. Baffling. Uh, yeah, I mean – Imagine the White Sox if they had, yeah. they had kept the road on where they'd be right now because he's been sure. great. He's fantastic. Uh, Minnesota right now plus 115 to win the Central. White Sox right behind them at plus 120. Uh, Guardians a little bit behind them at 4-1 to one odds. So I some that money, would be money, is, where money I... is to be had here with a very with a three-headed race kind of going down the stretch. I think that the Guardians at 4-1 to one is a really interesting thing. They are not that far behind in terms of talent of these guys. And again, they could get creative here with their farm system. They, they could make a move or two to get uh, to improve this lineup to be – I think that they, if, if I was going to lay down some shekels on one of those teams just to get the four to one odds, I might go the Guardians. I, I think they're a lot better than people are giving them credit for. They could go the Braves route. Like yes, they did last year Very and easily. just kind of get not like the knockout acquisitions, but you know, you Improve add it the all depth. together. 
Yeah. You know, you can hit on two or three of them and you never know what can happen. I mean, we've said for years that the Guardians should be adding bats and they never yeah. really yeah. seem to do it. But this yeah. is a year they could sneak sneak in, win this division, and maybe do some damage in the postseason because they always pitch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're great at that stuff. It'd be fun. I think we can at least say somewhat confidently that Cleveland's not going to be a big time seller at the deadline. No, oh, yeah. thank goodness. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I, I think they get creative, maybe go for like, yeah, quantity over quality and just add some depth to that roster. Mm-hmm. Ta- I mean, they have the payroll space to take on a bad contract to, to add a bat, some kind of like veteran slugger um, who's in his arbitration years or like, you know, making too much money for, for the production that he's putting up. They, they have like that that room to do that. And if they feel like the division is winnable, which it certainly looks like it is, I, I, it, it wouldn't shock me if the Guardians kind of try to go for it in a creative way. Absolutely. I mean, I think with all three of these teams you mentioned, I, I would say for financial components for the uh, Minnesota and Cleveland and for the lack of farm system in Chicago, uh, I think all three of these teams are going to be very on the fringes of the trade deadline where they're just kind of see like, let's see where the bigger chips fall and let's see what kind of falls through the cracks. And that's going to be where the target's going to be because I just, I don't see them being in the, in the play for the big, for the big bats like, you know, uh, Josh Bell or Wils Contreras. I don't see them being on the, the market for the big arms like Luis Castillo or Frankie Montas or any of them. So it seems like those guys who fall through the cracks, those ones who are left standing, those will be the ones that I think can make a real impact in this division because it only takes one or two, as we saw from the Braves last year, make a couple fringier decisions, like you said, Chris, and yeah. it can work out for you in a pretty big way. And it's worth pointing out, too, that this is a team that has like a log jam of quality infield prospects. Like they are going to have to make some maneuvers around here just to get guys like Tyler Freeman and Brian Rocchio and Gabriel Arias a chance to play. You know what I'm saying? So like moving those guys, I mean, I, we'll, we'll probably talk about this guy in a little bit. There's no way in heck you're ever going to get a free agent like Juan Soto to come to Cleveland, but they would be they have the perfect system to make the trade for a Juan Soto type of bat. It'll never happen, but I just wanted to throw that out there. With their depth in their system, they would make perfect sense for that type of trade. Well, before we get to Soto, because uh, this is a midseason pre-trade deadline show, so yeah, we're going to talk about Soto. Let's talk about the NL Central a little bit here first, um, finish up that conversation. Uh, Brewers currently leading the division. Hey, it ha- it's, it counts as a division. All right, it counts. Just like the Nationals are one of 30 teams, this is yeah. one of six divisions. <laughs> uh, Milwaukee um, currently leads, like I said, by a half game, a 50 and 43 record. St. Louis right behind them at 50 and 44. Um, despite the fact that Milwaukee has only a plus 25 run differential, St. Louis plus 65. So say what you will about all of that. Brewers on a little bit of a cold streak here, three straight losses before the all-star break. Uh, Drew, obviously I'll start off with you here. Um, Milwaukee minus 191 to win the division. Cardinals plus 140 to take home the NL Central crown. Where are you putting your money for the rest of the season? Um, I think it's <laughs> I think it's going to be a dogfight. So much of this depends on what happens at the deadline. And the Cardinals know that they have to add. They have to add mm-hmm. multiple arms like – I would even say two starting pitchers um, and a, some kind of mid relief help. I also, I'm getting the vibe that they're really going to go for Juan Soto. Um, and I, I don't, maybe it doesn't happen before August 2nd. Maybe this gets pushed to the off season, but the Cardinals are in position to do that yeah. deal because they sure. have seven top 100 prospects by the time Goldschmidt's money comes off the books and he'll be 37 two years from now. That's when any kind of sun, Juan Soto extension would kick in. So it like, it kind of lines up perfectly for them to do it. I don't, I'm not saying they're going to do it, but they, they can do it if they want. And that's what makes it interesting. So I don't know if, if they were to add a a big time bat and then like, you know, maybe Noah Syndergaard or like Madison Bumgarner off the scrap heap. um, I would definitely take them to win that division because I don't think the Brewers really have the room to to add on a lot of payroll um it's always kind of been a a low payroll operation and they're sort of at the level 
you know, the ceiling of what they can do. They need Freddie Peralta back, which it sounds like yeah. he is actually gearing up and about ready to face live hitters and, and could be ready yeah. sometime in August, which is huge. Um, they just – they need their guys to be healthy. Um, right now, I think I would bet on the Cardinals because I – I anticipate them doing something because they've they've built this whole year the marketing about you know celebrating Yadier Molina and, and Albert Poole's final year and perhaps Adam Wainwright's final year. And if you're gonna do that, this is the year to actually be aggressive at the trade deadline, which they haven't really been, I don't know, over the last decade. They've kind of just held firm and made the playoffs and then lost in, in the first round or like maybe make it to the NLCS, but then get blitzed by some much better team, sure. which is, it's a good business strategy. Like they pull in a ton of money that way by being competitive every year. I don't necessarily hate it. Um, I, I'm glad they haven't really done the rebuilding thing since I've become a Cardinals fan in like 1996. Yeah. Um, but I, this is the year that they should actually get a little uncomfortable. And I, I think they might. Yeah, I, I, oh, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I always fear the Cardinals. Don't make the postseason somehow. I mean, last year at the deadline, what they got, John Lester and what was the other pitcher? Uh, Jay Happ. Jay Happ. Yeah. Right. Somehow they made that work. But it, but it yeah. worked. Yeah, it worked. It did. I don't know how, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're positioned very well for, for Juan Soda. I know we'll get into it later about, you know, the, the favorites there. But, you know, I think a big half from Brandon Woodruff is, is very possible. He kind of really hasn't been all there in yeah. the first half. Uh, Josh Hader has struggled a bit recently. Um, so, I, I mean, I think he's capable of better, too. I, I still think the Brewers are potentially a scary team, but I don't see them making an, a huge addition at the trade deadline. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be on the Cardinals, too. It's too bad, too, because Milwaukee is in a great position in terms of where they're at with their prospects to make a big addition. Like they have three outfield prospects in Jackson Churio, Sal Frelick and Joey Weimer. That would be the top outfield prospect in 99% of systems. And that's not even including Garrett Mitchell, whose stock has dropped a little bit, but still is a guy that a lot of people like, um, like they are to me, like when you said the Cardinals had seven top 100 prospects, it made me kind of, uh, smirk a little bit because I would disagree with that assessment. It's not a terrible system by any stretch of the imagination, but I think the depth is a little bit there behind what uh, yeah. Milwaukee gonna, has. Yeah. It's to has get there. Soto, they're going to have to trade Jordan Walker and Mason Wynn. Like, Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. I, I mean, like, look, the, Milwaukee would be in a great position here, too, if they wanted to move one of their arms and if no they way. wanted to move. But it's never <laughs> going to happen. Milwaukee would never, ever, ever explore trading for somebody who has the financial stuff that is going on with Juan Soto. I still think Milwaukee is the best team in this division. And I think the fact that uh, we haven't seen Brandon Woodruff at his best, we haven't seen Josh Hader lately at his best, that just makes me more excited about this team. Now, they are going to have to add a bat, and I still think they will. It'll be a cheap bat. Um, Josh Bell would make a ton of sense, I think, for the Milwaukee yeah. Brewers. Yeah. Um, but it's it's still, to me, the, the more complete team. And uh, holy crap, the rest of this division is just awful. Well, that's the thing, yeah. I mean, the – the Cardinals have the easiest rest of season schedule of, of any team, I believe. Interesting. Like the, the Brewers have already covered more of their NL Central opponents than than the Cardinals. And the Cardinals also have, I think, six games against the Nationals left too. Ooh. Um so I'm that if you look at schedules and both of these teams have the Brewers and Cardinals have played poorly against teams that are above five hundred, but played really well against teams that are below 500 and interesting and the Cardinals are going to get more of that in the second half. Yeah. Let's talk about Juan Soto now. Cause we're just sidestepping it. We're dancing around it. Let's just get right into it. Juan Soto, obviously if you've lived under a rock, um, welcome to the sunlight. And also Juan Soto wants to be traded or is going to be traded at some point. Um, turned down a 15 year, $440 million extension, um, which is, such a large sum of money, but also I get it. So yeah. like I totally get it, which is hilarious. Um, but it looks like now the Nationals are willing to listen to offers for Juan Soto. The trade deadline is August 2nd, so they've got a very short window to try and get something done now when his value is theoretically the highest because you'd get an extra postseason run with him versus obviously waiting until the offseason when there's a little bit more time to make a trade. But his value dropped because you're only going to get him for two playoff runs currently on covers right now um the mets have 
four to one odds. I have the best odds right now, according to covers to bring Soto into the fold. Uh, they are four to one Yankees right behind them at five to one giants at plus five fifty. Dodgers at Dodgers and blue Jays at six to one and Cardinals at seven to one Mariners plus seven fifty. So those are the top eight, at least according to, um, to covers right now. I'll ask you this question first, guys, before we talk about where they go and all the rest is, does Juan Soto have a different Jersey on August 3rd? Wow. That came through. That whistle came through. Well, um, um, Man, when this news for story first broke, I think DJ, I don't know, did we do a podcast that night? Or we talked about it, and it seemed like it. It's such a complicated deal with so many different tentacles and angles, and such a big decision on the Nationals' part and any team that would acquire him. That I thought, all right, this get, probably gets pushed to the off season. Right. But the more that comes out, like Jesse Doherty of the Washington Post, who's a great beat writer. Mm-hmm. His article today kind of indicated they're they're doing this or or they're they're at least like opening up the phone lines and and trying to work things out, and it sounds like this might have actually started a couple weeks ago. So it's not mm-hmm. like when we first heard the report is when the negotiate or the discussions with other teams started. So I think the Nationals probably have offers on their like real real offers on their table already, and if they find one to their liking. Um, I, I think maybe it does happen. The interesting wrinkle is like them trying to throw Patrick Corbin into yes. the mix, too, yeah. which would kind of diminish what they would get back in return, right? I don't yeah. – unless uh, they're, they're really just trying to get to the smallest payroll possible in anticipation of selling the team. Like that's yes. a huge factor in all of this too. Yeah. But if – I don't know. If you're coming on as a new owner, well, I don't know. The business of baseball – runs differently than it runs in my heart yeah. we're, we're like i would think as a new owner coming on you'd be like no i want i want to be able to make the decision on soto at least right but really probably the way these billionaire owners think is like no let's get the payroll as low as possible yeah. we're guaranteed money anyway yeah sure we're, we're gonna run this like the a's until we have a better farm system Ugh. right right no, i think that's, you're right yeah that's you're probably right. the reality of it yeah so i'm gonna say i'm gonna put 80 percent. it does happen before august 2nd i agree I agree. I'm, I'm with you. I, I think there's also like a lot of hard feelings that are starting to, to come out that, you know, could push it to the finish line. I, I think the interesting thing about Soto, it's like there's a couple of ways to look at it. If like you're the acquiring team, it's like, are you acquiring him for just the two years? Or are you acquiring him with the idea of like, yes, we're definitely going to lock him up. And if right. that's, if that's the case, does, does it change what you're willing to give in, in a yeah. trade, yeah. you know, if that's the case, that makes the Mets more attractive. That makes the Dodgers more attractive. That makes maybe even the Cardinals more attractive who two years out can, you know, that, that contract looks a bit more reasonable. Mm-hmm. I sure. think the, the amount of teams in this might be smaller than you think, because totally, yeah, you're going to be, you know, he's going to make 30 million AAV guaranteed. Like yeah. that, that has yeah. to happen. And that's sure. why that's where that offer fell short and looked huge. But, you know, when you break it down year by year, it's really not. And, you know, we're getting into five hundred million dollar level. That's what it's going to take to lock him up. And so I think that's it's, it's a small group of teams that can do that. So I will say I've talked to a lot of people about this. And when I talked to him, it was interesting. That news broke and I had Jake Mintz on the podcast and he was talking to me about it. And uh it's worth pointing out Jake Mintz had a concussion that night, so maybe everything he said wasn't quite logical. But he did bring up the fact that the, the ownership change was going to be happening and making that. But I think you guys make a great point that that might actually be a benefit, and that's why the Patrick Corbin stuff is happening. Now, Major League Baseball teams, if I'm the Nationals, trading Patrick Corbin – is just an on top of the unbelievably large, delicious Sunday that you're going to get for Juan Soto. I mean, I keep going back, and again, part of this is based on the fact that I've watched my Mariners not lose a game since July 2nd. But this is a team that literally wow. talked about not making moves uh, in the offseason because they wanted to keep that payroll flexibility. And they have one of the best farm systems in baseball. They have the ultimate, ultimate ultimate reclamation product in Jared Kelnick, who's killing AAA pitching right now and financial flexibility of the yin yang. Like this payroll is still in the bottom third in baseball right now. 
And I have talked to some sources in Seattle that suggest that they are pretty aggressive in this thing, like very interested in making this happen. But they are going to have to move somebody like a Logan Gilbert in that move. And it's going to be difficult because their starting pitching depth is non-existent behind the big five that they have right now. Ultimately, to answer your question, though, I would say I would be shocked if Juan Soto is still wearing a Nationals jersey on August 3rd. So just before we hopped on here, Bob Nightingale of USA Today, and whatever you think about Bob, I mean, he's he's a funny follow on Twitter, but he nails a lot of these reports. He, he right? does. He seems to do that, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, huh. but he, he wrote that seven teams have begun making pre- preliminary offers, and that's the Mariners, the Padres, Giants, Dodgers, Cardinals, Yankees, and Mets. I think that's kind of the yeah. – that's those are the, the suspects. They make right? a ton of sense, yeah. yeah. I think those are the seven teams that are in the running for this. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. I, I, the Giants make a ton of sense. To I know me they as do. Well. They just do. as a just yeah. as a team that um, needs that middle of the order badge, has a very good farm system, has the um, man. Juan he would Soto. just look good in that uniform. They're an, old, he, they're an old team. They need like the new blood and like the yes, player to yeah. the rim for that. For Abs- guys. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, they need to keep up with what's going on uh, with in that division as well. I mean, this is not a team that I think is going to be anywhere near rebuild mode. And I, I just want to point out, like, this is Juan Soto, folks. There should be no untouchables for Juan yeah. Flippin' Soto, right. man. You're you're getting two tell and a half Mets years. Fans, by the way. Oh my <laughs> god! Tell it to Cardinals fans. <laughs> uh, tell it to Mariner fans. I've literally gone on the radio and had to explain why you can trade prospects for. A boat's a boat, but a Juan Soto could be anything. Whatever. Yeah, it's just so flippin' frustrating, man. Juan I have said Soto. that same sentence, Chris, yeah. like five times to different Yankee fans, where I'm just yeah. like, oh, yeah. so Jason Dominguez could yeah. be Juan Soto. You know who yeah. could also be Juan Soto? Juan yeah, Soto. Juan Soto. Like, that's what yeah. He's 23 years old. This he's is not 23 years old. And Talent, he's going yeah. to be signed to a relatively reasonable contract for two years. And even if you can't get him signed to a long-term deal, if you're like a team like Seattle or St. Louis, to say you can trade him for more than you probably gave up is an understatement. Somebody is going to want that bat for the rest of uh, eternity. This yeah, is a, yeah. a special baseball player. You give up anything and everything that you could possibly give up to get him. For the acquiring team, the extension can wait, right? Yeah. Unless yeah. Like, you're the Mets and it's Steve Cohen's like, you know, we're re- we're doing it today. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. I, I think for all those other teams – the extension can wait until next spring or yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe you actually wind up flipping Soto again. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Colin, where are the giants on that covers odds? Giants are third best odds at plus five fifty. Okay. Yeah. Those that, that's like the kind of thing you can't actually bet on anyway, but I was going to yeah. say I, the giants make a ton of sense long-term. Yeah. Well, yeah. You do. mentioned the giants on top of that. The other two of the, uh, two of the other seven names you just mentioned are teams in that division as well, the Dodgers yeah. and the Padres. So, yep. I mean, we we have this Juan Soto conversation about what does it mean to add him to your lineup. There's sure. also the conversation about what does that mean not adding him to any of the other lineups that you have to face either in the division or honestly yeah. in the postseason. Sure. He's just that much of a weapon that is going to move hands probably at this deadline, and it's going to change World Series odds in a pretty drastic way one way or the other. I'll Chris, ask you this, Chris. Chris one second. What is a what is a package from the Padres look like? Potentially, I mean, a, Robert Hassel the third. I would suspect. Sure, um, you would be looking at. I think C.J. Abrams would be a highlight Warren of that Abrams guy. Is, is a guy that doesn't um, uh, can be moved, even though he's technically not a prospect anymore. I believe. Um, Luis Kips, James Wood is a guy. A lot of people really really like as a six foot seven 240 pound outfielder who can move and has a chance for big time power um you could also be talking about uh uh Esturi ruiz as a guy who put up just monster minor league numbers the padres could absolutely get this done i think as well and you could add somebody like blake snell as well who blake snell could be a trade pack a partner for uh washington you could flip uh, Blake Snell into something else as well. They would yeah. make an awful lot of sense. By the way, I how sad it, is it yeah. that we're not talking about the Boston Red Sox as somebody for Juan Soto? What the hell is the point of financial flexibility and trading Mookie Betts if you're not interested in trading for Juan Soto? Mm. Great, great point. They have I, two players yeah. they need to keep on their roster right now. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? the hard part. Andrew Bogarts, Rafael Devers, lock those guys up. 
sign them and sign Juan Soto. You oh, own yes. freaking EPL teams, man. You can <laughs> afford can these guys. Red Sox, by the way, nine to one to get. Okay, so they're at least Soto. They're so at least they're, they're giving them the respect. They're right outside the seven that I mentioned. They're number eight on that list. So gotcha. I mean, at least they were they're in the conversation. But you're right, the Devers and Bogarts extensions probably take a little bit of precedence here. Also, considering they're also, I mean, Bogarts, I mean, Devers is 23 years old as well. Like, I mean, we're talking about maybe not similar players in terms of overall as Juan Soto, but got to lock those guys down. Um, it does this conversation change? You mentioned the idea that obviously, look, Soto is a Scott Boris client. Scott Boris clients tend to hit the free agent market and 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 drive up a bidding war there. We, you know, obviously you talk about the Cardinals, you talk about the Mariners, you talk about the Yankees or Dodgers. There are contracts on the books that you're looking, okay, we don't have to worry about an extension for another year or two. But it, are you willing, are teams, especially like the Mariners, who might, you know, are going to have a harder time signing up for 500 million plus at the end of two and a half years? Is it a harder time to trade for Soto knowing that it might, you might not have first right of approval to kind of sign him long term? He still might be going free agency at the end of two and a half years. And if you're a team that's willing to pay the money, could you live for two and a half years of Juan Soto before he hits free agency and then go sign him without giving up this, you know, quote, Herschel Walker-esque trade package in the process? It shouldn't. Like, it, it shouldn't. It, it, it probably will. And the teams that are thinking that way are probably just not going to trade for Juan Soto. But literally having him for half of this year, all of 2024 and all of 2025 should not affect, in my personal opinion, the package that you're going to put together. Because... You're talking about a three-year window here. Like it, yeah. it, it opens your window yeah. so much when you acquire a bat that this is good. I, I just don't think people are who are on the other side of this thing are um, thinking through just how good Juan Soto is and just how much three seasons of Juan Soto truly, truly is. Yeah, I, I would look at it for – through 2024, if if I was acquiring him, I think you have to look at it that way. Yeah. Um, unless unless there's some kind of deal there where it's like you know some kind of backroom agreement that you're gonna have a, a window to do an extension, which I, baseball doesn't really work like that. That hasn't no. that hasn't really happened in a, in quite a while. I yeah. Right. The R. A. Dickey trade from the Mets to the Blue Jays. <laughs> there was an extension agreed to right away. Yeah. That was so. There was long the Johan Santana trade from the Twins yep. to the Mets, and the extension was signed like as the trade was made, um, as well. But that's pretty rare that that. I mean, the Mookie happened. Betts trade to the Mookie Betts trade to the Dodgers was there was a sign well, less than a week after that trade. I was I'm trying to think of anything else, but. That's the closest I can think of in terms of like a player of this caliber changing teams. Mookie Betts signed within a week. I'm not sure if you see Juan Soto, if any yeah. team trades for him. I'm not sure if any team gets the opportunity to sign him right up front. Yeah. I think it's very possible he goes into free agency. And, and let's not forget that with the Betts trade, though, there was talk about that the Dodgers may have traded for Mookie Betts and gotten zero games out of him. That that extension, I don't think really – thing right yes yeah. that is correct yeah that there was talk about that season being canceled and that the contracts were going to be carried over so it's it's I, that one's a little bit different but at the same time uh, just 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 trade for Juan Soto and be happy all right Chris trade for Juan Soto and be happy what trade what if you're the Nationals what package of top prospects and minor and major league players from what team oh. do you want as the return like you That's... basically have your choice the menu is open you just have to I mean, choose what to eat. I, if Seattle is willing to trade Logan Gilbert or George Kirby on top of Noel V. Marte and Emerson Hancock, and you're probably going to get some other really – the Mariners have guys like Lazaro Montez, who is one of the most talented prospects in all of baseball. It's just the fact that he's like 13 years old is why he doesn't make these lists. That would be awfully tempting for me. San Diego as well, just because it's fresh from uh, – DJ asking me that question. By the way, the, the Padres have a prospect named Nerwellian Sedano, which is going to be one of my favorite <laughs> names for an awful long time. The Seattle package is really interesting to me just because of the fact that, if, especially if you can get Logan Gilbert, who is already pitching like a number two starter and has not even come close to tapping into his upside, and you can get a Kelnick, and you can get a Hitchcock, and you can get a Noel V. Marte. That's going to be awfully tough to beat unless St. Louis is able to add 
like a Carlson plus a Walker plus a win plus some other depth stuff. That's going to be really tough. I think that's the offer, dude. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, I think the Nationals are going to look for player, and especially, well, I, I guess it depends on what these teams' motivations are. But, right. like, I think you want to be able to show something pretty quickly to your fans, like, here's what we got, you know? So the Mariners have a lot of players, like, who are either in the majors, like you said, um, with Gilbert, who's already in a major league rotation, having success. We've seen mm-hmm. Kelnick shown flashes. These other guys are close. I think that's kind of what you want if you're yes. trading Juan yeah. Soto. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I don't think you want lottery tickets for Juan Soto. You yeah. want no, something that there's... you can immediately turn around and say, like, look, here you go. This is yeah. this is what we've got. We're going to get better quicker with these guys than with just one Juan Soto. And I think and you that, can that get... we have. You can get your lottery tickets for Josh Bell if you want to go into the oh. to, to the young guys who may not be ready until 2024, 2025. You can do that. And Josh Bell should be uh, somebody that everybody wants. Like that is such a good young bat to add to for this these final few months and maybe for even longer than that. But yeah, if you're trading Juan Soto, you have to get guys who are either ready to play right now or going to be ready to play very, very soon. All right, one word answer. What team is what team is Soto playing for on on don't, August? Don't 3rd? do this, Colin. Don't do this. I'm gonna do it to you because <laughs> come on, it, it would be a dereliction of duty for me not to ask you this exact question. Oh, Chris man. is the one cringing least, so I'll I'll, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, Yakult swallows. Uh, I'm gonna go with. We're the, all gonna I, say our own team. <laughs> you know what? I, I I'm I'm gonna do we it. We are I sitting here that, with four of the seven right now. So you know what? I'm going to change it up and I'm going to say he's playing for the Cardinals. I think it's the Cardinals too, man. I, I just, it lines up. So, and I wouldn't have, I don't know. I'm like a pessimistic Cardinals fan. So please, if people hear this, like <laughs> I, I told a friend the other day that I think it's 39% that the Cardinals get him, nice. which is high. Yes. Um, I, they're just, they're positioned to do it. They want, a, they like under the build a wit era. Who's the owner. They like having a face of the franchise. You know, Goldschmidt and Arenado are only getting older. Um, they can build around a, a $40 million a year player. They can do it. They're, they've been so good at developing young talent. So if they're worried about, like, losing cost control guys, they can hopefully replenish this system. I know they're super high on Jordan Walker and Mason Wynn, but, you yes. know, they're not Juan Soto. Soto. No, they I are certainly not. I think it's the Padres. I think it's the Which, Padres. Too. I think I think it's more complicated for the Padres. Than it people is, are saying. but I think yeah, they're I, not afraid to trade. You're and right. That's, no, you're right. that's, that's true. <laughs> well, I mean, like if we're talking that route, I, I think Jerry Depoto has made a trade. I'm, I'm well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little yeah, but I and will I say also this. I think there's something like the Padres, like on paper, we're saying like this is a really good team, but like the mix has been wrong for whatever yes. reason, sure. and I think they're willing to to shake things up and see what happens. They're definitely I, less risk averse than the Cardinals or pretty much anyone on that. And, and AJ Preller is general managing for his job right now. And I don't think we can say that about very many Good people uh, in this thing. And also if I can see Juan Soto play in those city connect uniforms, I'm closing my eyes and picturing <laughs> oh, it right man. now. Oh, I am so happy right now. I'm leaving. This is, this is all I needed today. I think the center. Cardinals are on the city connect schedule next year. Oh my oh, God. Is. It's going to be cracker crust pants and Provel cheese jerseys. <laughs> and it's like a toasted ravioli on top of the ball cap. I'm already. Oh it. yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> With a little marinara in there. <laughs> I'm with you, DJ. I think the I think the Padres have a, a, between Camposano, between CJ Abrams, Mackenzie Gore. Like, if that's the top three that we start this conversation with, I think that's pretty enticing. AJ Preller, like you said, a guy who is not adverse to going out and getting this done. Uh, you know, he's already came out pretty heavily and said, like, I want to pair Tatis and Soto, and the idea of two years. I mean, maybe two plus, depending on when Tatis gets back this year. But the idea of two years with those two at the helm I just, um, I don't know. and Machado, yeah. like that's the, one of the scariest. The, the Machado two, contract is the amazing. The Tatis contract, they're going to have to extend Joe Musgrove if they want to. They're kill probably him. not. Like if the Padres did trade for Soto, I don't think he would stay there. Like that's the thing. I, agree. I think they're yeah. going to say, you know, we got three years of this amazing trio together. Right. With, you know, Tatis yeah. and Machado. And then. Preller's the kind of guy who'd be like, okay, I'm going to trade Soto this year. You know I, think, I, mean? 
I think the Blake Snell portion of this is really underrated too, because of the fact that you can trade for Blake Snell because the, the Padres have the pitching depth in order to move this guy. He might be their worst of the six starters as well. Somebody's going to be interested in Blake Snell as a reclamation project. You too, think so? You could, the Nationals are? Uh, the Nationals aren't. The Nationals are going to be interested like a, in trading him. Three team trade. Okay. Yeah, uh, trading him for somebody else to get more assets because that's what they're going to be interested in is cheap, young, cost controllable type of players. And, you know, there's the Mariners have the Logan Gilbert aspect of it. But you know, the other thing here is it's tough for the Mariners to trade Logan Gilbert because they have just no pitching depth. If Logan Gilbert's truly available, though, I still think that's actually where he ends up going. All right, so let's move on to the rest of the trade market. There is a larger trade market outside of Juan Soto. So let's talk mm. about some of them. I, mean, I know it, no one wants to talk about it, but there is. Um, a lot of a lot of interesting names out there that could get moved over the next few weeks. Um, nothing close to what we saw last year. Obviously, last year was every 30 seconds there was a major move going down somewhere else. The Soto news really upped the ante this year, but removing him aside – this is a slightly more uh, down year this year, which I, and with the expanded postseason playoffs means that a few less sellers than maybe we'd have in years past. Um, I'll open it up to all of you guys. DJ, why don't you start us off? Of all the names that are not named Juan Soto, who has the biggest impact that gets traded this year? Uh, probably Luis Castillo. Um, mm -hmm. And he looked really good against the Yankees recently too, uh, yep. which I think is big. Um, for those AL teams and even yeah. maybe for the Yankees. Um, you know, when Castillo's right, he's he's an ace, you know, yeah. and there's not many of those who are going to be available um, at this trade deadline. So I, I think he could be a huge uh, needle mover where and wherever he ends up going. And I think the Reds could be an active team. Um, yes. Tyler Malley is a very talented pitcher, too. I think we could see him get moved. Uh, Brandon Drury has been ridiculous, and I'm sure he'll get moved. It's not going to be a get major pieces back, but I think the Reds are going to be active at the deadline. Yeah. Drury's a big sell high there as well. Like, I mean, for five years, he almost was, he didn't have a team to call home for more than six months at a time. And all of a sudden he put together a borderline all-star performance. He would make a ton of sense there. Luis Castillo, obviously probably the best arm on the market. And anytime you're the best arm on the market, you are the prettiest girl at the bar and everyone wants to come talk to you. Chris, who else do you think outside of Castillo and Soto makes the biggest moves the needle the most for a team acquiring? Now this is dependent on health a little bit, but I think Frankie Montas, I mean, the, this guy's stuff I think is the best of any pitcher that's available. I would imagine that Oakland is asking for a ton, a, an absolute haul here, but at the same time, like Luis Castillo is very, very good. And when he's on, I think he is maybe a little bit better of a pitcher, but I think Montas is the more consistent. Also have to consider some of the salary stuff as well here. Um, Montas and then Wilson Contreras would be just yeah. right below him. But yeah. it sounds You're like Wilson mine. Contreras might not be traded, which is the weirdest thing in the world to me. There hasn't been much chatter about it, has there? It's very odd. It's really strange. I, but, like, so many contending teams need help offensively at the catcher position. I yep. think Sean Murphy of the A's is going to be yep. an intriguing name, too. Yeah. And the, the A's might do better in that deal than they were probably even anticipating. Josh Bell, we've already talked about him a bunch. He can definitely sure. have an impact. I'm see, I'm interested to see how Tyler Malley looks. Uh, he's supposed to return to the Reds rotation on Sunday. Yeah, another guy like Montas that has had some some shoulder problems at a very inopportune time, but he was awesome last year. Like hasn't has been mostly mediocre this year, but he's still missing bats. Just the ERA has risen. Um, I think Tyler Malley could be an interesting arm, and then there's guys like Syndergaard and Bumgarner, mm -hmm. um, who just you know are, are owed a lot of money, but uh, I, there are you know 15 teams that need starting pitching help. Like everybody needs starting pitching help. So I think those guys wind up getting moved. What else can the Angels do? Yeah, uh, I don't. I, I, mean, I don't, they're not going to do Trout. Um, I, I know there was like a, a tiny little bit of chatter about that a couple weeks ago. But I, I mean, talking about the first half, like how disappointing is it that the Angels are not a contender? Like I, to me, that's continually the so. The it half. sucks, man. I, I, I... They have two all generational talents on the yeah. same roster, and somehow we are still irrelevant at the all-star break. I they don't are understand 20, how that's possible. 
They are 20 and a half games back of the Astros, and they are it's right where you want to be. Yeah, <laughs> 11 and a half games back of the Mariners for a wild card spot. I mean, that is just like so disappointing. And, you know, I will say this Shohei Otani, I don't think he would get moved this offseason, but or this trade deadline. But he's not a long term. He's not a guarantee to be there long term. You yeah. have to wonder at some point what your and I can't even fathom, especially considering that these teams who just love cost control and love being able to say that you could get a pitcher and a hitter all in one thing. I can't even fathom what they would give up for. How about like the that. How about the Royals? Like what? I mean, Ben Benintendi, Benintendi, Michael mm-hmm. Taylor. I think the the bullpen they kind of clean out, right? Maybe yeah. Zach Zach Granke finds a new home. I think they should they should yeah, be possible. active. And we had Ann Rogers of MLB.com beat writer for the Royals there. And she was like, Yeah, the the front office philosophy has changed to where I they're they're not gonna hold on to these guys no anymore. Yeah. Roto Pat yesterday on the podcast brought up that it would be very funny if uh Whit Merrifield got traded to the Blue Jays. And it's kind of funny too because of the organizational fit. He could be a guy that could help them, but it would be uh very funny. He would have to get get the jab. Yeah. The, I, I, he he jo- yeah. We joke that Justin Trudeau would be there with open arms, and in both of those arms would be a couple of needles as well. So. <laughs> it's the first and second dose, one in yes. both. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, we'll talk about that a second because obviously you talk about Whit Merrifield. We brought up Ben Intendi. Um, we heard the Yankees were very much in on Ben Intendi in this conversation, and then all of a sudden he couldn't. He was one of the ten Royals who could not make the trip above yeah. uh up north and suddenly the yankees pulled back and said we have no interest because we, a we play the blue jays in the regular season and b we might face them in the postseason, postseason sure. there's a there's going to be a couple names obviously with ben attendee and merrifield at the top of players who have chosen not to be vaccinated and that then affecting their trade market which i think is just going to be a an interesting little wrinkle in the background that's you know I think teams are going to have to keep in mind while also kind of trying to deal like I only get them for two months and now I might not even be getting them for the full two months. I might only be getting them for like a month and a week because I'm I'm losing them for some games in the process. Yeah. Um, Obviously other names out there that could get moved. We talked about Oakland, Paul Blackburn made an all-star appearance this year. Uh, You got to assume he, his name is absolutely on the block when, I mean, you could, you can make an argument that Paul Blackburn is a top five arm that could get moved during this deadline. Sure. Um, uh, from the bullpen side, Jorge Lopez for the for Baltimore. You could very easily see him finding a new home. David Robertson for the Cubs. Uh, both of these guys probably not walking into a closing job anywhere, but a high leverage setup role, absolutely. Um, also sticking with Chicago, Ian Happ made an all-star team. Uh, he is another guy. This is a sell high um, when you have an opportunity, especially for all those teams that might have looked at a Benintendi, been shied off of the from the vaccine requirement and such like that, now suddenly there's a pivot to Ian Happ. I wonder if his market kind of blows up a little bit more when Benintendi's market is a little bit more um, pressed down. And then obviously, I mean, he's been moved a couple of times, been on a couple of different teams, slight down here, but Nelson Cruz is still Nelson Cruz. Is there a sure. world that the Nationals find someone to take him off of their hands for the rest of the year? Maybe especially a National League team that has not quite figured out the DH as of yet. Nelson Cruz could be a solid contributor there as well. Yeah, I, I like those names. You know, speaking from a, a Mets fan's perspective, I think Juan Soto was just like not realistic necessarily. In division, um, yeah, that's real tough. Yeah, I, I could see Josh Bell, though, being in division. That's very for sure. Happened. Yeah. Um, and Ian Happ would be a good fallback for me. Trey Mancini's been mentioned a bunch in yeah. connection with the Mets. That's an interesting question, too, if the Orioles should uh, actually move him. Um, CJ Crone has been mentioned, too. Yeah. I'm a little leery about that. Um, I, you know, I think he can probably hit outside of Coors Field, but the numbers are so stark. Sure. Um, and I think he could be you know, decent enough, but not really a big difference maker for the Mets. But I think we'll see Crone move, too. There's plenty of bats out there. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's, certainly, there's certainly more bats than there are pitchers available. But uh, yeah. yeah, those are those are some of the other names I've heard. I was just kind of looking at this relief market 
and it's not super exciting. I mean, relievers are never actually super exciting. There's a reason why we have to, uh, we actually have a fight before all four of us um, to f- see who has to talk about relievers during our season preview stuff. But one name that I think is really interesting, except for the fact that he's not even arbitration eligible until 2024. David Bednar, I think, could be somebody that the Pirates could get a haul for. Like, this is a guy who I believe has like a 1.14 ERA right now. Good bat missing ability, has shown the ability to pitch as both a closer and a high leverage guy. A few teams, I think, in these of these contenders could really use an arm like that. And I'd be really curious to see what he could go for. And on top of that, I I think was. Oh, go ahead, DJ. I'm just going to say, Drew and I did a Pirates episode a couple of weeks ago. And there was just sort of the sentiment like, no, the Pirates want to keep them. But why? Like, they yeah. are not, they're not going to win. No. I, mean, I, I don't even want to estimate. Yeah, them. Jason like, Mackey just, like, shook it off. He yeah. Like, just, like, I think about, I mean, in the next three, four years, do you really think they're going to be a contending team? To me, no. Maybe in two or three. Three is what I would Maybe. guess. Yeah. yeah. But that's the best case scenario. Yeah. Are Unless they Sixers start spending. So, I mean, I think you do it. I think you do it. Yeah. And then you, you find your closer when it's time. Yeah. So and Chris I'll, I'll mention one Chris one other on name of, the idea that like a pretty good haul you can get back for him right now with an amount of years of control. Oh yeah. yeah. And also sure. unlike the names like Jorge Lopez or David Robertson, who probably moved to like a setup role on another team, Bednar could potentially move into a closer role on a good sure. team because that's how good he's been. And that yeah, that's kind of rare to sometimes find on the trade deadline right around now. One other name I want, yeah, the the Phillies should be all over that. Uh, One other name, one other name that I think is kind of interesting, John Birdie, just because of the fact that like we are a fantasy show. This guy is uh, very good at stealing bases and can also play all over the field. I don't think he's the a long term portion of what Miami is building. I'd be really interested to see if he could go to like a contender and be a guy who get plays every day, but plays every day at a different position. I think that'd be a really interesting one. Yeah. So let's talk about just overall, how do you guys feel? I mean, as we enter the second half, are there any players or teams? (laughs) I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Are there any players or teams (laughs) that you have a real strong opinion that are about to have a big second half? Um, like uh, Chris, why don't you start us off on this one? Is there any players or teams that you feel have a big second half ahead of them? Um, I'm going to say the blue Jays. Cause I heard, just heard, uh, Drew say it. And I'm, I think that, look, this is uh, in my personal opinion, the most talented roster in the American league. And I think that there are some guys who have underperformed that are going to start performing at a much higher level. I think Bo Bichette is going to have a huge second half. Jose Barrios cannot possibly be this bad or inconsistent to, if, if you want to be nice here. Way too talented of a baseball team. I think that they have no chance of ch- catching the Yankees, but I would be uh, surprised if this wasn't still a 95-win baseball team. I believe in the talent that much. Yeah, Chris stole my pick. Um, yep. I think the Blue Jays are going to uh, – the White Sox, sure, too. Like, they should be. Uh, but I guess LaRusse is holding them back or something. Good manager. Really yeah. good manager. <laughs> just need to intentional walk more people on one, two counts. Don't just... dude. Don't bring ageism onto this podcast. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, we keep getting older. I don't want to bring age into ages. Yeah. That's a fair point. Just yet. Um, I, I will say, I, I think Boston has a, I mean, the pitching is still very much a question mark there. And the Chris sale broken pinky comebacker is a, Genuine bummer for Red Sox fans as he just comes off the IL. But a Evaldi back is a big deal for them. Um, obviously, bringing up um, Brian Bello and a couple other young arms has been really helpful. Moving Garrett Whitlock back to the bullpen seems like that's what they're going to do. That seems like the most logical spot for him. Yeah. And that offense, while it's been very good this year, is still not quite producing up to the level that you'd expect. And I still think Boston has a run in them. Remember, this is a Boston team last year that did had very similar starting pitching and made it all the way to the ALCS. Sure. Um, this is a team that I still think, obviously they're not punching up anywhere in the American League East. I think they're 14 or 15 games out of there, but I think this is a very much a team that has a run in them that could obviously launch them up towards the top of the wild card. I will note that the Rangers, like their plan bringing in Marcus Simeon and, 
Corey Seager looked really silly, like even a month ago. But those two guys have both been really. Oh yeah. yeah. Not, not that the Rangers are uh, going to contend. And, I mean, and throw John Gray in there as well, who yeah. that was the other big signing, and he's been really excellent over the last two months. Yeah. So that they're going to be kind of, and they're not going to sell those guys. So they're going to be a dangerous, like spoiler kind of team down the stretch. Um, and then so, hope, hope going into next year, maybe they can feel a little bit better about their long term picture. So this isn't team centric, but more like players that I'm looking for as like X factors during the second half. Mm-hmm. You mentioned Degrom, Ronald Acuna Jr. If he can be closer to his superstar self, he he hasn't looked great so far. Uh, I think his OPS is is south of 800 right now. So can he be his true self during the second half? Um, I think Bo Bichette is another one underperformed mm-hmm. during the first half. Huge expectations uh, fantasy-wise. What can he be uh, in the second half? And Fernando Tatis Jr., when do we yeah. see him? Yeah. Uh, what does he look like? What difference can he make in, in the playoff race? I think those are some really uh, big names that you know we should look for during the second half and could make difference in fantasy races as well. Absolutely. All right, so let's talk about some futures bets in this conversation. Obviously, we mentioned a couple of them earlier just as we were talking about divisions. But let's just talk about, obviously, the award races and division races and, obviously, pennant and title races here. Um, Let's talk about a couple of them. The NL MVP award right now is a heavy betting favorite towards Paul Goldschmidt. Um, he currently, as I'm pulling it up right now, plus 100. Yes. Oh, I have him at minus 100, but either way, Ooh. basically same thing. Uh, minus 105. So same thing. Um, but so the odds are in favor for him there. And that's totally fair considering he's number one overall in average on base percentage slugging weighted on base average weighted runs, <laughs> runs created and war. So, you know, a pretty decent season. But in the event, so there's not much value on him there, but in the event that he were to be injured, um, I want to give a a look to P. Alonso here for the Mets. I mean, obviously his home run totals and RBI totals have been off the charts. Um, He continues to be an anchor in the middle of the Mets lineup. If he can get hot over the second half of the season, and again, it might take a a minor IL stint for Goldschmidt to kind of slow down a little bit on his end. But from eight to one odds for Pete Alonso as of this morning, that's a pretty de- if that's a pretty decent flyer on in the NL MVP race. Yeah, I think Alonso is is a threat, and I think he'll have like kind of a narrative maybe on his side if the Mets win yeah. the division. If he sure. has those shiny home run RBI totals, and and don't underestimate, he's become a lot better disciplined at the plate too. Absolutely. So- I think he could post a decent batting average too, and and the case will be there if if the Mets win the NL East. I wouldn't rule that out. And the thing with Goldschmidt, I mean, if you look on like Baseball Savant right now, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to nitpick about his season, but if you look at his expected stats, they're not overly impressive. So, let's say he has a bit more pedestrian second half, that could really even the playing field. Sure. Um, and Machado's there too, and the numbers yep. are still really good with him as well. I'm Plus looking at 50 entering today, Machado. Yeah, I'm looking at points bet right now, and there are three Dodgers that you got Freddie Freeman at 12 to 1, Mookie Betts at 14 to 1, and Trey Turner at 18 to 1. I'd be tempted to lay some money down on all three of those guys, and especially Freddie Freeman. Like, Freeman, I yeah. just think he's going to have a monster second half. We've already seen him start. Already started, yeah. Up. Yeah. Uh, expect more power for him. I think there'll be a little bit of a narrative thing here too with his first year in Los Angeles. I saw one of the worst articles I've ever seen written talking about him uh, in, in his uh, mental state. And I think some people might rally around a different sort of thing right here. But all three of those guys I think are great odds. I think Trey Turner is going to have a massive second half as well. I mean, Goldschmidt has to be the favorite right now. It's very hard for me to see him playing at this level for the rest of the season, but that's that's not an insult to him. That's just a compliment to just how good he's been. Let's uh, let's go over to the American League here. Obviously, it's been pretty much a two horse race in the AL MVP running between Shohei and Judge. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody on this list as I'm looking at it that I'm willing to put any down ballot shekels on past those two i think this is pretty much a two horse race here yeah and i think unfortunately as a yankee fan short of aaron judge 
passing Maris yeah. and putting like 135 or 140 RBIs on the board. I don't see how he ends up taking down Shohei, who just continues to be dominant on both sides of the ball. So uh, I, I don't even know if plus 140 for Judge is worth it. I think it, even almost even money for Shohei still seems like the only place I would feel confident in putting any dollars. We if could maybe I, see the, the Angels like pull off a bit on how they're using Otani, but point. we, we kind of said that last year and they didn't. And he's, you know, he's going for – He's going to try to get the biggest AAV of all time when he yes. gets free agency after 2023. Yeah, so I, I I think he's good to go for what he's been doing as the right. two-way superstar that he is. And Yeah, I mean, I think if you think about value, like if he's pretty good at both, you could still say he's the most valuable player yeah. in baseball. 100%. But see, the thing is, he's so good at both. Yeah. yeah. You, you really don't have any other choice. No. I think the only thing about Otani is sort of like the trout thing. Like you see how good someone is and you kind of like get immune to it. And there's like yeah. a fatigue to it and the angels aren't good. And you know, if, if uh judge hits 50 plus homers, the Yankees win the division, they win 110 plus games. You could see it maybe turning that way, but I think voters are smarter than that. So if I'm not sure they've gotten fatigued. I don't think there's enough show not, fatigue just not it's quite just yet. Like you, if you yeah. see it all the yeah. time, you get sure. it just becomes like sure. a little bit more normalized, right? I will say, and this is me being a person that is absolutely the prisoner of the moment. Julio Rodriguez at 150 to one, man. Coming. Who I'm just telling you right now, too, the narratives in this stuff matter. If the Seattle Mariners make the playoffs for the first time since two thousand and one and julio rodriguez is the best player and I like this I like something this like take. something like otani and aaron judge who look you talked about the fact that the the angels if these things are not going swimmingly there could be less uh on the mound stuff and there could be some days off aaron judge has not exactly been a beacon of health in his time like i had a long conversation with my buddy michael bauman about the fact that this guy may not be a Hall of Famer only because of the fact that he just hasn't been able to stay on the field. Mm -hmm. 150 to one. That's awfully, awfully, awfully tempting to lay like 10 bucks down. You're feeling awfully giddy right now. This Mariners win. Yeah. Someone's really biting at it right now. I know that this is like, they are, (laughs) they are absolutely living on uh, last breath and have gotten to take advantage of, just the luckiest schedule in the entire world for this 14 game winning streak. And 10 of their 13 next games are against the Astros and the Yankees. So this could all come plummeting down, but like getting to watch Julio Rodriguez play every single day. I mean, this guy has a chance to be the best player in baseball. I mean, I have 150 to one odds. That's uh, yeah. I complain about those 10 bucks. Go buy a dune buggy. Um, Let's go. Let's go over. (laughs) Let's go over to the Cy Young races now and we'll start the National League. Sydney Alcantara minus one thirty, the heavy favorite there. Corbin Burns behind him at seven to one, so a pretty decent um, gap in between the favorite and runner up. And personally, in my mind, I don't think there's that much of a gap in their stats for that for that much of a gulf to be between the favorites and the second place. I mean, this is and the second favorite this. I think Corbin Burns is very close to Alcantara, and more importantly, Burns has just much better strikeout numbers than Alcantara, who just eats innings and goes eight and two-thirds on a regular basis, which, don't get me wrong, I think a lot of older school voters are going to absolutely fall in love with him because he is that guy who wants nine innings and wants the ball in his hand to finish out the game. Not many pitchers are doing that anymore. But Corbin Burns and his elite strikeout ratios, I mean, Brewers make the postseason here in that conversation. I think there I think there's I think there's plenty of value on Burns to potentially take home the Cy Young. Yeah, I wouldn't bet a take a minus odds bet on a Cy Young race because no. Alcantara's arm could pop at any moment. I like Burns there, just short yeah. and sweet. I think that's actually the move. If you're gonna play some action on this, that's like, the value. Yeah. yeah. The the value, I get that and all of that stuff, but I would just if I'm not betting on Alcantara, I'm not betting on anybody. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, too. I'm sorry, fine. man. Like he has been easily the best pitcher in baseball. This is already a five win player on baseball reference. That is insane for a starting pitcher to have five wins going into. And you know what? 
the thing that uh, we see too is that we see a lot of these guys who vote on this stuff, and I know it for a fact because I've talked to beat writers who do it, kind of just sort by war. They just start looking at that, yep. and it's very easy to sort by war. And this could be a nine or eight or nine win pitcher. And in today's day and age, as long as he's healthy, and that's the reason not to make the bet is because it's negative on a guy that is throwing a baseball overhand. There is a chance that an injury is going to happen, mm-hmm. but there is – no way that you can say anybody but Sandy Alcantara is the heavy favorite here. I think there's a fairly substantial difference here. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, right behind Burns, Gonsolin at twelve to one, Musgrove at fourteen to one, Freed at sixteen to one. Mm. Uh, is there anybody there? Is there any there or anything past that you that you're sprinkling a little anything on? Nope. I mean, Zach Wheeler, I think is worth looking at too. Maybe. Mm. Yeah, but that's mm. that's pretty much it for me. Yeah. Uh, let's go over to the American Le- American League Cy Young. And like the MVP race, this feels like a two-horse race on this front between uh, Sugar Shane McClanahan and Justin Verlander, who, by the way, could not be farther apart in age than I than for two guys who are clearly going for the same award. McClanahan, 2-1, to one, Verlander, plus 260. So pretty much an even race there. Past him, Shohei, Cole, and Dylan Cease. Um, how do you guys feel about the American League Cy Young moving forward? I think it's I, way wide open. Yeah, it's yeah, wide it's, open. Yeah. I've been worried about... I think with yeah, McClanahan yeah. and... Sorry, Drew. But I think there's workload concerns with those top two. And, sure. and that's why this could go in any direction. Yeah. I agree. Yep, I would say the same thing. It's. Um, I, I do think, again, I'll bring up the word narrative here too. Just the fact that Verlander came back from what he did as a as as an yeah. age type of thing, I think that he might be the little bit of favorite here. But it's also hard to bet against a guy who has struck out like a hundred and billion batters in three innings somehow. Like McClanahan season's been amazing, but if I had to bet, I think I would bet on Verlander. Yeah, I get that. So if you if this is open, where is the down ballot? If you got ten bucks to throw down somewhere down ballot, where are you putting that outside of the top two? Obviously. I mean, a lot of a lot of great pitchers out there in the American League. Not a whole lot of people absolutely running away with it. So I would say that you're feeling the value. I've just noticed Robbie Ray at 80 to one. He's been one of the best pitchers in baseball since uh, he had like a four point nine four ERA because he just couldn't avoid a big innings. He's been outstanding over the second half of the season. I don't think he can catch these guys. Shohei Otani, if he got the chance to actually pitch enough, I think would be really interesting here. And it would be really fun to see an MVP and a Cy Young, uh, both as winning an MVP. You know what I'm trying to say. That's amazing. That would be a really cool thing to see. Cole Um, is kind of boring, but I think that's. Yeah, absolutely. Garrett Cole at at 10 to one is really interesting. Alec Manoa at 21 to one, I think is what I'm seeing here is pretty interesting as well. I would imagine that there is going to be some ups and downs as a second year pitcher, but uh, yeah, there's some value to be had in this. Yep. Uh, Flipping over to the rookie of the years. I mean, American league, I don't think we're even going to have a conversation here on short of short of, unfortunately, I I don't want to give Chris any more time to talk about the Mariners on this full on this full league pod, but we're let me enjoy my moment, man. There's (laughs) it's going to come crashing down so hard. Let me enjoy this. It is interesting though. Like, if we were having this conversation two months ago, Julio Rodriguez would not be the favorite. Like yeah, Jeremy Pena was, like, yep. borderline running away with this thing. But everything we've seen from Julio Rodriguez, as long as he stays healthy, is he's going to be a winner. By I'm curious to see even what the odds are. Uh, I see. It's minus 350. Minus, yeah. yeah wow. Minus 400 on mine. So, I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, so, National League Rookie of the Year. Again, barring injury. J Rod takes that down, but let's talk yeah. National League, and I think National League is actually very interesting. Obviously, you have the fireballer and Spencer Strider for the Braves, and you have Michael Harris, who are currently the one-two going there. Yeah, uh, and that, which then brings into the kind of just general like you trust in a rookie starting pitcher down the stretch or a rookie hitter down the stretch. Usually, yeah. a hitter in that conversation. Behind them, O'Neill Cruz, Seiya Suzuki, and Nolan Gorman. Um, so. Drew, why don't you start us off with this? Uh, if you have a couple bucks that you're putting down, where are you putting it? Strider as plus 165, Harris plus 200, 
O'Neill Cruz nine to one, Seiya Suzuki twelve to one, Gorman eighteen to one, and so on and so forth. I think it'll be Strider or Harris, but if I'm betting this, I'm going with Seiya Suzuki. Actually, yeah, I like that too. Um, because I mean, he missed a month or six weeks with with a a wrist hand issue, uh, but he's back now and he's he's an ultra talented dude who's you know much older than a lot of these guys are coming over from Japan and. Um, the Cubs are going to let him run wild down the stretch. Whatever he wants to do, he's going to be their only source of entertainment. Um, I, I like that. What is it? Plus 1100 right now. 1200. Yeah. 1200 yeah. is what I, have, I don't know but... if I would even bet this, uh, but if I'm going to, it's going to be Suzuki. I agree. Totally. I, 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 wouldn't I, go pitch, I wouldn't go pitcher here. No. Um, I, for me, it would be Harris or Suzuki. Those would be my two favorites right now. Cruz is as exciting as he is, you know, yeah. approach. Yeah. issues i think there's going to be flashes of like amazing stuff that we see on in gifs on twitter and Absolutely. stuff like that but i think you're going to see some inconsistency there um so yeah i think suzuki is a, is a decent value if you want to go that way i think chris morell i think at 20 to 1 is actually a little interesting as well he's been yeah. a really solid um you know and we'll see some ups and downs from those guys spencer strider as good as he's been i imagine there are going to be a couple of starts that just really hurt his line like like a, a one and two third innings six run type of thing where he just can't find the command and michael harris who i like a lot too is going to have some ups and downs those are, are the overwhelming favorites and then i'd put suzuki at third but at 20 to 1 chris morrell who has been honestly probably the most consistent full-time rookie so far is, is a little enticing yeah from a fantasy perspective for guys like Spencer Strider, for guys like Hunter Green, for a lot of these rookie pitchers out there, Mackenzie Gore, are you looking to potentially try and move them from a fantasy perspective, knowing that there might be obviously innings limits or just simply fatigue towards the end of the year? Yeah. And redraft leagues, especially, I'm definitely looking to uh, sell high on those guys. If I can get established arms instead, who might've been a little bit worse, but you know, trading the upside for the floor is not a bad idea at all, especially because it's almost guaranteed that all of those arms are going to have innings limits. All right. But I think that just about finishes up our show for today. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to reward us by ensuring you are subscribed to wherever you listen to your podcast. So you don't miss an episode. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please be sure to rate and review us as we love to hear your feedback. And while you're at it, be sure to follow NBC Sports Edge on Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch to be informed of all of our live shows, Q&As, segments, articles, and more so you can stay up to date on everything around the league and join in on the action. You can follow me on Twitter at Kyle Don't Lie, and you can follow Chris at Crawford underscore M-I-L-B, DJ at DJ Short, and Drew at Drew Silv. Be sure to tune back in on Sunday after the post game of the Phillies and Cubs to catch Chris and I live on YouTube to answer your fantasy questions and make so make sure you don't miss it. So guys, thanks for coming on. This is perfect. I'm glad we did this midseason episode. So until the next time we all get to see each other, stay safe out there. Good luck to your teams, both real and fantasy over the second half of the season. And as always, thanks for the listen. Dom Smith and our reliever of the year. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for all the latest fantasy and sports betting advice from NBC Sports Edge. And don't forget to sign up for NBC Sports Edge Plus to get the best in class draft guides, as well as season long fantasy, DFS, and sports betting tools that will give you the edge.